the best way to learn a language, immersion, living where the language is spoken and using it every day. But if that's not in the cards for you this year, you can still learn a language the second best way, and that's with Babbel. Be a better you in 2024 with Babbel, the science-backed language learning app that actually works. Don't pay hundreds of dollars for private tutors or waste hours on apps that don't really help you speak the language. Babbel's quick 10-minute lessons are handcrafted by over 200 language experts to help you start speaking a new language in as little as three weeks. Babbel's designed by real people for real conversations. Babbel's tips and tools are approachable, accessible, rooted in real-life situations, and delivered with conversation-based teaching so you're ready to practice what you've learned in the real world. For instance, I've been using Babbel's convenient courses to help me learn basic conversational skills in German while I'm getting ready for a little trip I'm planning. It's not a language I'd ever studied before, but I find the lessons really easy and kind of like hand-holding me through learning a completely new language to me. And it's reassuring to know that with the help of Babbel, I'll be able to greet people, order food, and ask for directions without having to consult language apps. While I'm in Deutschland, I'm still learning. Studies from Yale, Michigan State University, and others continue to prove Babbel is better. One study found that using Babbel for 15 hours is equivalent to a full semester at college. Babbel has over 16 million subscriptions sold. Plus, all of Babbel's 14 award-winning language courses are backed by their 20-day money-back guarantee. Here's a special limited-time deal for our listeners. Right now, get up to 60% off your Babbel subscription, but only for our listeners, at babbel.com slash vulgar. Get up to 60% off at babbel.com slash vulgar, spelled B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash vulgar. Rules and restrictions may apply. Do you love to shop? I love to shop. Like, do you shop while you're working, while you're eating, or even while listening to this podcast? Yeah, we all do it. We all know and love the thrill of the hunt. But are you getting the thrill of the best deals? Rakuten shoppers do, because they get the brands they love with the most savings and cash back. And you can get it too. Start getting cash back at your favorite stores like Nike, Bloomingdale's, and even Expedia if you're looking to travel. And you'll never miss out because you can even stack sales on top of your cash back. The idea is simple. Stores pay Rakuten for sending them shoppers, and Rakuten shares the money with you as cash back through PayPal or check. Rakuten is easy to use. Just download the free Rakuten app now and never miss a deal. Or go to Rakuten.com to start getting the most bang for your buck. That's Rakuten, R-A-K-U-T-E-N. Happy shopping. Hello, and welcome to Vulgar History, a feminist women's history comedy podcast. My name is Anne Foster. Sitting next to me is my cat, Hepburn, who you may be able to hear purring. She's real purry right now. And that's just a sort of professional business colleague relationship she and I have at the moment. Today is a very special episode because our guest is a person whose name you've heard me say at the end of every single episode since I want to say 2022. It's Christina Lumagi, who is the editor of Vulgar History and also has several of her own podcasts, which we talk about towards the end of this. So you can listen to and subscribe and buy the merch for all of her shows as well. But I really, I've wanted to have her on the podcast forever and I'm glad we finally figured out a time and a way to do it. And what she's going to be talking about is some Mexican history. So the last time we talked about Mexican history on this podcast was, I think, 2022, um, during the international season. We were talking about Malenzin, aka La Malinche, who was in the pantheon of just kind of like shitty things that happened to indigenous women of North America when Europeans came. I think she's in a a squad with Matoka, aka Pocahontas there as well. Anyway, so we talk a bit about what gets us to the point that we're talking about in this episode of Mexican history, because which is basically a lot of rebellions and wars and European countries coming in and trying to take over. And I just want to situate this in a place and time. This is more recent than a lot of what we've talked about on the podcast before. 
we're talking about the Las Soldaderas, who were the women who fought alongside men, alongside everybody in the Mexican Revolution of the early 20th century. So we're talking late 1800s, early 1900s. I mean, in terms of who we've talked about on the show, who lived around then, like Anna Mae Wong was born in 1905. So she was around while this was all happening. Helen Keller was born towards the late 1800s. Marguerite Steinheil. We haven't really talked about a lot of people from this period, and we also haven't talked a lot of people from Mexico. So I'm really so happy that Christina Lumagi is here to to tell us the story of all these interesting pants wearing people. So please enjoy. So I'm joined by a very special guest whose name you hear me say at the end of every episode, but she's never been on the podcast before. Christina Lumagi, welcome. Hi, I'm so excited to be here and to talk to you sort of in person. (laughs) Yeah, I know to like me. Well, just to see what we look like. Right. (laughs) Yeah. So we're talking about Mexican history. And first, I want to say you have you have several podcasts including one about Latin American history. Can you explain all your podcasts you have? Yeah, yeah. One just ended, so I'm not even going to talk about that one. But um, it was a Mexican soap opera rewatch podcast where we watched one soap opera. But my other one uh, is Spooky Tales. We talk about haunted places, myths, legends in Latin America. Sometimes people come and tell us their paranormal experiences. That's one of them. And I co-host it with my friend and my twin. And it's a lot of fun um, if you like scary stories but also to laugh a little bit. And then the other one I have with my twin is Historias Unknown. And we talk about Latin American history or Latino Latina history in the U.S. Um, And it's, yeah, a lot of stuff that maybe you're like, damn, why didn't I know this before? That was like the whole reason we even started it. Because, yeah, we ran into a bunch of stories. I'm like, why isn't this taught in school? Well, I mean, as you know, that's like what I keep finding in my podcast, too. I'm just like, why didn't I know that? And like listeners are like, no one told me this. I'm like, I know. I know. Yeah. <laughs> People need to know this stuff. But I think there's a real, um, I'm trying to find more Latin American history, like for my show, just I know there's lots of listeners in like Mexico and South America and stuff. And I, I want to learn about it too. So this is perfect to have you on here because this is yeah. <laughs> your area of expertise. Can I ask a question? Like you are of Mexican heritage, right? Yes. My mom is Mexican. Um, and then my dad is from El Salvador. So even a country even less talked about than Mexico. <laughs> yeah, I haven't I haven't found anyone for my podcast about El Salvador, but who knows one day, maybe. Well, I'm always available. <laughs> <laughs> so in terms of Mexican history, like, do you know what your ancestors were doing during this period, the Mexican Revolution? I know so little. So I know that my Great grandma, um, I think she was a kid at the time in Zacatecas, and they were like hiding out whenever the rebels passed through or any army, not just the rebels, but both um because there were so many so many sides to everything. Um, but yeah, they would they just were in their little um rancho, like a farm and yeah, just living. And I don't know anything about my grandpa's side of the family. Um, I wonder. Well, no, I was just going to say, just so the listeners know, this is kind of the episode, like your ancestors were like, they're hiding. And then, you know, big reveal, my grandmother was Mexican. <laughs> um, <laughs> this hasn't come up on the podcast before. <laughs> big reveal. <laughs> big reveal when you look at my skin tone. Yeah. So my father's mother, she was born in 1906 in Mexico. And this revolution like kicked off in what? It's like 1910. Yes. Mm-hmm. 1910. Yeah. So when she was a little girl, Basically, her mother was Mexican, my great-grandmother. My great-grandfather was American, like he was an American businessman in Mexico, fell in love, stayed there. But then because he was American, they had to flee during this because the revolutionaries were not fans of the Americans. So yeah, yeah, so just what I know, like from my aunts and uncles, because I never knew my grandmother very well for obvious reasons. Yeah. She was born in 1906. (laughs) I met her maybe once. She had a very, she still had a very strong Mexican accent. I remember that. So she spoke fluent Spanish still. Anyway, but she, so she just remembers being a little girl going on a really crowded train and then going on a boat and like fleeing and escaping. Man. Yeah. So this is like, I don't know much about Mexican history, but I'm like this, like you and I, like our literal ancestors were like <laughs> running away and hiding. <laughs> That's so weird. Yeah. <laughs> small, small world, I guess. Yeah. I know. So it's the closest I've felt personally to one of these stories. 
But yeah, so first, can you please explain? We're not going to go through the whole history of Mexico because it was just yeah, it's a lot. a lot a lot of people invading and a lot of revolutions happening. But can you situate us into like the Mexican Revolution? Like when was this and what what caused it? So the Mexican Revolution it takes place during what we call the Porfiriato, which is when Mexican dictator Porfirio Diaz uh, he just kept being a dictator, I guess. Really. <laughs> There was already like these like smaller battles kind of brewing because people wanted him out. Um, I mean, he ruled with an iron fist. It was good for the rich, uh, as these things usually go. Very good for the rich, bad for the poor. The poor always tend to be rural areas, indigenous people or overcrowded cities like uh, Mexico City was thriving again for the rich, but not for the poor. So uh, there was all these like people banding against him. Yeah, even before that, we had late 1800s, 1880s. The French had just invaded. It was like, that's the Cinco de Mayo uh, battle. That was the second French intervention. Um, and then there was like a little moment of peace. But then, yeah, then it was the Porfiriato. Can I just jump in and say from like my brief trying to understand all of this? Because I was also confused because there's like Cinco de Mayo, but then there's also Independence Day, which is a separate thing. And that's from the first Mexican War of Independence, which is from like 1810. So that's yeah. 100 years before. And that's getting getting um, independence from Spain. Yes, yes. And that was on September 16th. The Mexican Revolution, which started in 1910, it started with the call to arms to overthrow Porfirio Diaz. There was a lot of well-known figures that like people will probably recognize names because each one of these figures had then their own armies. So we have like Emiliano Zapata, Pancho Villa, Venustiano Carranza, Francisco Madero. And they all were called like the Zapatistas, the Villistas, the Carrancistas. <laughs> like... I have 100% heard those words. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so they all had their own kind of, were they working together or these are like, like different factions? Yeah. So, you know, in the beginning, they were working together because it was like this united front to overthrow Porfirio Diaz. That was like the main goal. But then as time went on, because it was it was a 10 year revolution. It was mm. a long time. Um, as time went on, there was betrayal, betrayal among themselves, um, fighting amongst themselves. But those are the rebels, basically. And then you have the uh, federal army or the nationalists. But that's like the other side. There's the side we don't like really care about. You know? We don't really need to be honest. Do we need to know the names? Not really. No, we don't. <laughs> the rebels are who we're all rooting for in this situation. The other guys, they're just kind of the government. Yes, yes. And like, I mean, bad things happen on both sides. Oh, Victor Victoriano Huerta. So they were the Huertistas. Um, that was one of them. I mean, yeah, but bad things happen on both sides. Women fought on both sides of the war. It was like it was such a divided war, too, because even among the, the elite, there was like, oh, the sons of the elite were like against their fathers. It was, yeah, brother against father, um, families fighting against each other. And yeah, women on both sides of the war. Well, and again, I'm just picturing, you know, like your ancestors just kind of like trying to keep their heads down and stay out of it. Like my ancestors like fleeing. Like I get it. Like everyone, yeah. you're either you're on one side or the other. Like nobody can just kind of like live their day-to-day -day life like it's just you have to pick a side yeah yeah and then you have like the rural areas like where Emiliano Zapata was from that it was like really in their best interest to revolt because they were in the worst conditions I mean they were you know working on this land that was taken from them for almost like no money the rich landowners who were all usually <laughs> of Spanish descent or you know um mestizos which are like the Spanish and uh, indigenous mix, but then like generations ahead where it's almost like not even considered indigenous anymore. Um, these are the people that had all the money. And so the the left, which was like Emiliano Zapata, I mean, they had more reasons to revolt than like other areas where they're like, oh, we just want to hide. We don't even know what's going on. And I mean, I think that's like a common thing in a lot of wars. Yeah, definitely. I mean, no spoilers, but like coming up, actually, maybe spoilers. I don't know when this podcast <laughs> is coming out. I'm going to be announcing soon what the next season's theme is. And there's a lot of revolution in it. And it's exactly that. It's exactly that. It's always like the poor people, like the farmers, like the people, like the not elites, like that. They just get fed up. Like that's where yeah. every revolution has always started. So that's just happening in Mexico as it, it did in other places. But we're talking about the women. The what do you call them? I call them 
las soldaderas, but they're known as uh, by many names. Las Adelitas. The song La Cucaracha um, was said to be uh, written about one of them. No. What? Yeah, the- yeah. The one we all know, like La Cucaracha, La Cucaracha, yeah. Ya No Puede Caminar. Yeah. The original, not original, one set of, of like very, very old lyrics is based on a soldadera written by... Uh, someone that was like for the Federalists, basically talking um, shit about them, where they're like, oh, these <laughs> dirty cockroaches are just here. Like, Is that what cucaracha uh, means? Cucaracha means cockroach? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. So that was a diss track about them. Oh my yeah, God. Okay. there is a version that's a diss track about Las Soladeras, but so specifically the ones on the rebel side. Because, again, there was on both sides. Right, right. But, yeah, they're known by many names. Um, in media, they're often depicted like these very sexy women with like the ban- bandoliers, I think is what they're called. Like, the, you know, the, the like, little bullet, bullet belts. Yeah. 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 But, uh, I mean, that's not the, that's not what they were. They were like women trying to survive and... <laughs> Some of them, some of them were badass. Yeah, yeah. And that's what we're going to talk about. But I think it's what we were just saying. It's like, if you're there and you're involved, like you need, you need to have your bandoliers on. You need to be out there fighting because like this, there's this 10 year revolution going on. You can't just sit back. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So the women, I mean, not to get into like the role of women in Mexico, but like they were not in the army before this, basically. No, no. And I mean... One could say that even after the revolution, not a whole lot changed for women in Mexico, because I, I think a lot of people know by now, Mexico is a very, very uh, anti-women society. They are full of these uh, machista, machista men. And um, so like very sexist, um, how women belong in the kitchen. And obviously like things have changed a little bit, but I mean, femicides. Uh, are at an all-time high violence against women and children, obviously, because it extends to children, like, you know, the patriarchy and all that. So, um, I mean, women were fed up because during this time, women, they could not own, I don't know, land. Women basically had no rights. They had to be married to get, I don't know, even just a small um, money. If, if uh, you know, I mean, it's I guess it's like like a lot of places where if a woman wasn't married to a man and then the they had nothing because it was their fathers, things like that, like... So it was not a it was not a good time to be a woman um, in Mexico at all. But yeah, under Porfirio Diaz, women were not considered citizens. They could not enter contracts, own or sell property. They couldn't be teachers, lawyers. They couldn't they couldn't do anything except yeah, be a wife and a mom. <laughs> and that's what is. And I think in other revolutions too, like you see, just kind of when like marginalized people are rising up, like it would be it'd be weird if the women didn't join them. But just I wanted to point out that like this is notable that the women did this but also the the sexism is part of why it's not widely known that women did do this like uh, they were there and then after the fact it's like let's just like pretend they were just these kind of silly sexy people yeah yeah and women like without the revolution soldiers probably they wouldn't have fought there's actually a previous war somewhere in I want to say Spain, and it's why people believe that the same thing would have happened in Mexico if women had not been at, at the scene of the battle. But men would fight and then just go back home to their wives. Like they they would not stay at the front lines because they I don't know they can't do anything <laughs> without women. It seems like so. Then they're like, well, the same thing's going to happen in Mexico. So yeah, women followed men into battle and they moved things. They kept everything going. And then after the war, like. They received little to no recognition. Even women who held like these very high positions in these armies didn't get their uh, like, you know, benefits for having fought in these revolutions. They were forgotten. And this was like they were left out of a lot of textbooks. I mean, there's like, you know, places here and there where that will include them. But like up till maybe three, four like five years tops, they started getting like these, the recognition they finally deserve. Like, yeah, women were part of the revolution. And I've seen just like in, because this was a topic that's been suggested to me by people before. So I'm excited to finally be able to talk about it with you. But when I've looked them up, it's like these badass women, like you see them, they're wearing their, they have the bandoliers on and they're just wearing like often, like sometimes long skirts or sometimes like pants. And they just look so badass. Like this group of these women, I'm just like, oh man, like if you saw them in a group, you'd just be like, oh God. I'd be scared. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) So give us an example. So I think one of the most famous or most well-known, as well-known as any of them are, it's Petra Herrera. Yeah, yeah. 
And again, because a lot of these women were not known. So, I mean, like even before we get to her, most women, they were cooking, cleaning and serving the men still in in the revolution. Um, They walked all day because horses were for men, not for them. Um, so yeah, they were walking behind whenever like the, the, they had to wrap up and move to a different location. Many times women were sent ahead of troops to collect wood, make fire, set up camp. Um, so it would be ready for the men when they arrived at like their new location. They had to go seek food ahead of them in these villages. If it wasn't given to them, they stole it. Some, some generals, uh, like General Alvaro Obregón, I I feel like he was a Federalist. I could be wrong, though. I cannot remember. Um, he used to send women ahead of his soldiers so they could act as shields for his men. Like it was it was a it was a rough time for women. And most women that were soldaderas, they were at the campsites, sometimes against their own will, like they were just taken by men. Um, some women went and followed men, their father, brother, or their like husband, boyfriend. Um, and some women, very few women, did intentionally like join to fight that number is not super high as compared to the women that were taken or just went because their whole family was going and they were raising like babies at these <laughs> uh at these um i mean in war i guess yeah it's it was it's rough but petra herrera so there's not a lot of information on her early life it's very hard to find but she was one of the people that or one of the women that answered the call to arms she join the army to fight not because she was following like anyone there so she i've read like conflicting accounts most of them say she joined pancho villa's army though some books say that it was i want to say like carranza either way the rebels like she joined one of their armies probably pancho villa she hid her identity as a woman and she went by pedro herrera this was easier for her because she suffered from goiter so like her neck was a little more um, swollen looking. So like it could hide like a potential Adam's apple, right? If you have a goiter, um, that's like this thing you get from thyroid. Like, you know, it's like a swelling in your neck if, for people that don't know. And then she also had a unibrow, like, you know, Frida Kahlo. You, like it was, she was very hairy. Yeah. <laughs> so it was not very hard. And like, you know, she, yeah, pretended to be Pedro Herrera. And um, she blended in perfectly. She was praised for her fighting skills, her bravery, her courage. She was, um, I mean, a skilled, skilled soldier. She knew, I don't know, like military strategy. I don't, I don't know anything about that. <laughs> um, military operations. Like she was, she was an excellent soldier. Um, she rose up in the ranks as Pedro Herrera. And she rose up so high, she thought she could reveal her true identity. Like, oh, I... I'm like, good, I, they, I'm they i respected by everyone. So she then revealed that she was not Pedro, but Petra. But I, it was not well received. Uh, Pancho Villa did not want women in his army. Um, and so he kicked her out. So this is like the reverse Mulan situation. Yeah. Yeah, because when they found out she was a woman, everyone's like, oh, but you know what? You're brave and you're great. And that's fine. Yeah, yeah. And they were not fine. A lot of like well-known like leaders of this time that yeah they didn't want women in their armies i think like two of them accepted women but even then they didn't like do anything to have them excel in their armies they were just like yeah you can be here most of them did not want anything to do with women in their armies pancho Villa, he didn't want any women at all not even because some some of these revolutionaries said yeah women can come because the men need them um we need our men to stay motivated like so yeah women can come but he was like no no one, like, no women, never, like, what's the thing from The Little Rascals? The Yeah, the no girls are allowed. Yeah, yeah. that was him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And he was also terrible and, like, really just hated women altogether. So this didn't stop Petra. She kept on fighting. She gathered a group of 400 women. They, I mean, all these women, they wanted the same thing, to put an end to the dictatorship in Mexico when the revolution. So it was 400, but then... It kept growing. Her army of women, it was 1,000. I've read sources that it was up to 2,000. So it was a, I mean, a battalion of women. I love that. I love that. that He was like, no, you can't be in my army. She's like, okay, I'll just start my own woman army. And 2,000 women are like, we're in. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, it was, uh, I mean, unheard of, really. (laughs) Yeah. And they fought aside men in battle. They were in the front lines. And they were very successful in the battlefield. 
for Petra, she did not allow any men in her, in her um, brigade or battalion, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> so it's the opposite. It's like no boys allowed. Yeah, yeah, not at all. And she would do guard duty herself like at night. And if a man approached, she fired on the spot. Like she didn't ask like, what are you doing here? Or who goes there? She just shot <laughs> at who, if, if a man was approaching. But And part of it was like, she knew how like, I don't know. I mean, and not to be like all men, but like, the men are terrible and it's scary in this in this era and place and time it's like yeah she's probably right 99 percent of the time yeah what are you doing here probably nothing good yeah, yeah i don't blame her for just <laughs> shooting on, on site like i would have done the same yeah and one of her battalion's most successful battles it was during a battle in the city of torreon Coahuila, and this was an instru- instrumental battle to the whole revolution like if that fight would have been lost who knows what would have happened in the future like if it was had to be won, and she was her whole army was part of that this took place on may 30th 1914 and together with pancho villa's forces like the very man that kicked her out of her his army (laughs) they took the city it was because of petra herrera though she had this plan to somehow turn off like all the lights in the city where like no one could see and that's why they won and there's one of his own commanders Pancho Villa's commanders who was quoted uh, saying like she was the one who took Torreon it was her and um, she turned out the lights and we were able to enter the city but like even though like his men were on record admitting she was the reason they won Pancho Villa obviously den- denied her their involvement all the women's involvement he was like no it was us like after this battle because it was so successful petra asked to be reinstated into the military but her request was denied because she was a woman so she was promoted to colonel but then her unit of soldaderas was disbanded and after this she joined venustancio carranza and she became a spy oh my god First of all, spies are awesome. But secondly, so this guy, like, he let women be in his Mm -hmm. battalion. So, okay, good for him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He was one of the ones that did allow it. And, I mean, Zapata, he was another one that allowed it. But Pancho Villa, he he Pancho Villa, no, no. (laughs) I I came into this not knowing anything about him. And now I'm just like, "Mm, he's my enemy now. Don't like him. Yeah, yeah. He was like the typical Mexican man. Um, Like, womanizer. Didn't respect women. Um, But yeah, back to Petra. So she uh, went undercover infiltrating the Federalist like locations. And so she was a bartender in Jimenez, Chihuahua. Some people say Ciudad Juarez, Chihuahua, somewhere in Chihuahua. That's where she was. Sadly, during one of these, like during her time as a spy, she was shot by three drunk men and then died due to the infections from the, the wounds. That's the double-sided thing of being a bartender in the middle of a revolution, I guess. Because on the one side, I'm sure she gets, like, bartender is a perfect when you said that. I'm like, oh, that's how to be a spy. Like, you're going to hear so much. Like, people are there, they're drunk, they're drinking. They're spilling the tea. (laughs) No, she would hear so much stuff. But then also, you're being a bartender in the middle of a revolution. It's like, they probably all have guns and they're all drunk. So, yeah. Yeah, very dangerous. But yeah, that, and she's one of the most well-known Soldaderas, but she's not the only Petra. <laughs> There's another Petra who's also pretty well known. I want to say first, though, because at first when you're talking about kind of the way that they're remembered as these kind of like sexy, isn't there? There's a movie that's like Selma Hayek or something where she's just got like cleavage and she's like, oh, we're the Soldaderas. Like nothing against Selma Hayek. But yeah. I think there's but that's not like, who they were. No, it was like yeah. this woman with a goiter and a unibrow <laughs> who could easily pass for a man. That's who we're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> And now we're just going to take a break for a word from our sponsors. As a podcast network, our first priority has always been audio and the stories we're able to share with you. But at Realm, we also sell some pretty cool merch, and organizing that was made both possible and easy with Shopify. When you think about successful businesses like Allo or Allbirds or Skims, an often overlooked secret is the business behind the business that makes selling and, for shoppers, buying simple. For millions of businesses, that business is Shopify. That's because nobody does selling better than Shopify. It's the home of the number one checkout on the planet. And the not-so-secret secret secret that's definitely worth talking about is that ShopPay boosts conversions up to 50%. That's more happy customers and way more sales going... 
If you're hoping to grow your business, your commerce platform better be ready to sell wherever your customers are scrolling or strolling, on the web, in your store, in their feed, and everywhere in between. Businesses that sell more, sell on Shopify. Upgrade your business and get the same checkout we use with Shopify. Sign up for your $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash realm, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash realm to upgrade your selling today. Shopify.com slash realm. Hi, I'm Jennifer, a founder of the Go Kid Go Network. At Go Kid Go, putting kids first is at the heart of every show that we produce. That's why we're so excited to introduce a brand new show to our network called The Search for the Silver Lining, a fantasy adventure series about a spirited young girl named Isla who time travels to the mythical land of Camelot. Look for The Search for the Silver Lining on Spotify, Apple, or wherever you get your podcasts. People often look at me with confusion when I ask them what their only one in the room story is. They think it has to be like mine, where I went to a 600 person event and discovered that I was the only black person there. I know, horrifying, right? Hi, I'm Laura Cathcart Robbins, and I am the host and creator of the podcast Only One in the Room. Every week, my co host Scott Slaughter and I invite you to join us for an hour and lose yourself in someone's only one story. This podcast is for anyone who's ever felt alone in a room full of people, which is to say that this podcast is for everyone. And we're back. Um, and the other Petra, her name was uh, Petra Ruiz. And her nickname during this time was El Echavalas, which the book I read, uh, Revolutionary Woman of Texas and Mexico, translates translates that to spitting bullets. But I would translate it more to like the bullet spitter. Um, <laughs> she was just out here <laughs> spinning bullets, I guess. But she got this nickname because she would just fire from behind Adobe walls and she was insanely accurate and she had a violent temper. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, perfect nickname, perfect nickname. But that's like, you know, if someone is, she's like insanely accurate, she's so good at being a sniper. It's like, I'm glad a situation came up where she could use that skill because in her daily life, it's like, do the laundry, like raise the children. Like, yeah, like she would never know that she was this fierce warrior. She like. wouldn't know that. Yeah, exactly. So I'm glad she had an opportunity. Okay, so spitting bullets. Yeah. Yeah. So there's one story about her where she stumbled upon three soldiers who were arguing about who was going to be the first one trigger warning to rape this woman that they had just taken. And she and she had a, an identity as a man as well. Pedro, like no one knew she was a woman at this point. And so she dismounted from her horse and <laughs> she told them, let her go. This one is mine. And everyone already knew Pedro Ruiz was deadly with guns. He was he never missed and he had a violent temper. So they were like, no, it's, she's yours. We're leaving. Like, we're out. Then she put this girl on back on her horse and they rode away, like, back to the girl's village. And the whole time the girl was very afraid because she thought this man was taking her to do the same thing, right? And when they were far away enough, she got off her horse and she was like, <laughs> in a very tits out manner, just opened her shirt. <laughs> <laughs> and she's like... There's no reason for you to be afraid. I'm a woman like you. Like, I'm not going to do anything to you. <laughs> That's the first time I've ever heard tits out as like a reassuring. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. Saved saved by the tits. It's amazing. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it's just like one very well-known story about her. But she led a battalion that um, helped defeat the federal army in Mexico City she was promoted to lieutenant. She revealed her identity as a woman and stated, and I cannot remember who, and I also couldn't find like specifically who she was fighting, whose army she was in when she was uh, Pedro Ruiz, whoever it was, uh, one of the revolutionary leaders. Once she was in this battle and she was promoted to lieutenant, she revealed her identity as a woman and she stated, I'm revealing my identity because I wanted to be known that a woman served for your army as a soldier. And then before she was expelled from the army for this, she resigned like before, like, no, you're, I quit. Like, you're, <laughs> <laughs> you can't fire me. I quit. Yeah. yeah. That's pretty much what she did. <laughs> yeah. That's great. That's great. I like, I like that. Um, she's just like, just so you know, like, you think that women can't do shit, but like, guess what? I've been a woman this whole time. Peace out. Like, yeah. yeah. And there's this very famous song 
called La Adelita, which for the longest time was like the only thing that acknowledged there were women in the war. But even then, it's this like love ballad from a sergeant to a woman that he met in the revolution. And some think it was written about one of the Petras. No one knows which one of the two because there was two of them. But there's also another possibility that it was written about a different soldadera named Adela Velardo Perez. And that's like his Adelita. That would be like a nickname for Adela. So that could Makes the most sense. Yeah. Yeah. And her story is a little different. She was the daughter of a wealthy man from Ciudad Juarez. I mean, that was a common thing for like children of wealthy, uh, the elite to join the revolution on the side of the rebels. But um, from a young age, she showed interest in medicine. And around 13 or 14, like very young, she ran away to join La Cruz Blanca, the White Cross. And this was the um, nurses, basically, the medical field that did allow women um, to like help in, in these uh, wars. Adela, she was said to be friendly, bold, brave, super smart. She left against her father's wishes and, you know, joined to be a nurse. And she was in the front lines of of these battles, along with other women. Like 13 years old. Like Yeah, this, 13, 14. Wow, wow. Yeah. yeah like, yeah. I was on MySpace at that age. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I know I'm trying to think like, I don't know, you know, like Greta Thunberg, just like this little girl who's like, I'm going to do this. Yeah. 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 Um, And yeah, they were engaging in combat, treating the wounded. And she met her husband during this. But then he passed away. Uh, They had a son together. They traveled together from like location to location. So she uh, she was being a nurse, like a medic and (laughs) raising a child. Well, I mean, first of all, she's doing this like and she's pregnant. And then she's doing this like. Yeah. Wild. Um. Could not be me. With a child, no. <laughs> yeah, no, like her commitment to the cause is like... Yeah, yeah, all these women. And after the war, she lived in Ciudad Juarez. And she was never recognized for her work in the war, as well as, like, you know, the rest of the soldaderas. At some point, she worked as a typist and moved to Texas. And that's where she is now buried in Texas. And it wasn't until 1962 that she was recognized as a veteran of the Mexican Revolution and received a pension. And she died in 1971. Like, <laughs> she had nine years of, of recognition and a pension. Well, that's the thing, too. Like, for all these women, like, if they weren't recognized for what they did, then they're not going to get things like a pension or, like, uh, the respect of being a veteran. But that the men who they worked side by side with would all be getting that. So, yeah, yeah. The song the that was, you know, written in dedication for her, it was written by a Sergeant Antonio del Rio, and he was in love with her, but he died in battle before he could tell her. Um, so this was not even her husband. <laughs> but sadly, the song, along with um, like other, I don't know, things that depicted, they depicted Las Adelitas as these sex objects. They didn't get credit for their actual work in the war because the song doesn't say anything about her being this badass uh, medic. It's just like, oh, I love you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and that's what Mexican media did, like, to to all these women. Which is, I mean, I'm always trying to sort of, like, connect it to other things I've read about. But this reminds me a bit about, like, in um, World War II, for instance, in, like, in the U.S. There was the men were off at war, or even World War One, And so, like, it's like, who's going to work in the factories? I guess the women will. And they did all these jobs. And then the men came back and they're like, we'll take our jobs now. Can you just like raise our children? And the women are like, what? Like, it's the same thing. It's like, you just prove that women can do stuff. But then once it's over, it's like, oh, let's pretend that didn't happen, actually. Yeah, yeah. Another uh, notable woman, Carmen Velez. And uh, she was known as La Generala, which is like the general. But because words are gendered, you can just add an A at the end. The female general. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. And she commanded 300 men in battle and they fought in Hidalgo, Tlaxcala. That's all I know about her. <laughs> like some, some of these women only have like one sentence or two about them. But like the fact that she like everything you've said about, you know, with, with both of the Petras where it's like you can't, you know, boys only, like no girls allowed. The fact that this person, La Generala, like that she was leading men, like men would follow her. That feels notable. That they were yeah. just like, we're not going to listen to a woman general. They're just like, oh no, you are in charge. Yeah, yeah, like she she didn't have an army of women. It was men who followed her. Yeah. And her identity was known. Like it was known she was a woman. 
you know, it's funny because for the longest time I served in the army for like four years. I was a medic and my aunt, my tia would call me generala. And I had, I'm like, I feel like that's what she was referring to, but I didn't know for, until I did this research and I was like, oh my God, that's what my aunt would say all the time. <laughs> that's interesting. That's interesting because maybe if there's like, if there is in sort of like the oral history or the cultural history where it's like, it's not widely known, but people still know that these women did that, you know, and just like the, the name. Karen. Yeah. Like the, a little bit about them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and Carmen, of course, wasn't the only Carmen because it was a very uh, popular name at the time. Petra and Carmen. That's yeah. That's the name. And yeah. And it's, it's such a great name. So Carmen, um, Carmen Cerdan, she was known for her ability to procure supplies for the troops. She was the daughter of a lawyer and her family, they were part of the Maderistas. So uh, I never remember if he's Francisco or Fernando Madera. His last name is Madera. That's like the important part. Um, another part of like the rebels. So they were known as Maderistas. And for this reason, her home was attacked and the family was taken into custody by the federal army. Uh, she was wounded, but she survived. And this like really just threw her into working for the rebels even more. Um, she's like, I'm going to work even harder now. <laughs> she was disguised as Marcos Serrato. And she used this code language that she developed with newspapers like in Texas to coordinate supply runs for the revolutionaries. So she put like, I don't know if you have examples, but she just put like, I don't know, you know, it's like the crow calls at midnight or whatever in the newspaper. And somebody would know like, oh, that means send like two cases of bullets or whatever. Yeah, something like that. I could not find like like what she actually like wrote or did. But she used newspapers to do this and like nobody would have supplies if it was not for her. Like, I wonder if it's like, you know, like misconnections or something like that. Or if she put in an ad. Oh, that'd be you know, cool. Just, <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know. Like, that's great. You know, I love I love a code. I love a spy. Yeah. And just, I mean, such important work that just like nobody thinks about it. They think of these men like, you know, in the front lines, like shooting each other. But you need supplies. <laughs> no, you need medics. You need supplies. Like these are, it's like the invisible labor that makes it all possible. Like they couldn't, everyone is contributing, you know? Yeah. And like on the note of invisible labor, on top of um, the women that were in the front lines, the women that were not, the ones that are even less talked about. I mean, they were cleaning up the camp. They were cooking for the men. They were making sure that the men could keep fighting. There was American journalists were on like the side of Texas taking pictures of uh, women on top of trains, like making tortillas for the men. <laughs> <laughs> like, and they were just like, how are they doing this? Like the train is moving. They're making tortillas uh, for the men. Like, yeah, even the women less talked about. Like, that's the whole reason that the the revolutionaries won this yeah. war and like no one gives them credit until like you know very recently they're like starting to get talked about but yeah even the women not in the front lines the names that we know they kept things moving like did the laundry the cooking they took care of the kids like everything everything yeah no absolutely yeah yeah that that invisible labor is so important too and so not recognized but i mean i think it's similar to like so many other like, quote unquote, great men in history. It's like, yeah, but how much could he have done if there wasn't, you know, servants and a wife and people at home, like making yeah. his dinner and getting his clothes? Like, yeah, those people are never given any credit. So I love the podcast called Significant Others. Have you listened to it? No. Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> they're talking about um, the significant others of these like men who are less talked about. So it's a fun listen if anyone wants to check it out. Oh, that sounds good. And then let's see, another soldadera that we know a little bit about. Um, her name was Angela Jimenez. She was the daughter of a Zapotec woman, so an indigenous woman and a Spanish man. In 1911, the federal army, soldiers from the federal army, invaded her home and, uh, again, trigger warning, um, attempted to rape her sister. Her sister killed the soldier who tried to do this, but then she later died um, by suicide because she couldn't like bear what happened to her. Um, so then Angela Jimenez swore to seek revenge and she joined the revolutionary forces. Um, she fought alongside her father under the name Angel Jimenez and she was an expert in explosives. She reached the rank of lieutenant and at this time uh, she was a known woman. Like she was fighting as a woman. She wasn't okay. hiding her identity anymore. 
Well, I was thinking like if she's there, her father would have to be like covering for her identity too. If- In on it. Yeah. Yeah. But then she was wounded during some battle. She left the army, uh, moved to Texas, then to California. And then in California, she organized or she created the organization called Veterans of the Revolution. And then she became an activist for the Chicano movement. So she wasn't done fighting. (laughs) And that's just like, because we're talking about, you know, what is it, 1910 till 1920 or so, this revolution. It's like, yeah, we're in the 20th century. There's so many cultural movements. Yeah, and if someone, yeah. if someone was 13, 14 during this, yeah, and they can move move to California and become involved in movements in the 1960s. Yeah. And it's so weird to think about. <laughs> I, well, I know exactly, because this feels like so oldie timey, but it's like, no, no, like this is the 20th century. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's mind boggling, really. <laughs> mm-hmm. And then there's another woman that we do know a little bit more about. Sometimes the stories are like a little contested, but this is how like, The well-known story goes. Her name was Elisa Greenson Zambrano. She was from Parral, Chihuahua. And already at 12 years old, she was a strong believer in Villa, uh, Pancho Villa. And she had a strong opposition to the federal army and American forces in Mexico. Because in Chihuahua, they were allowed to be there for various reasons, including trying to help the federal army capture Pancho Villa. Because I think... If there's one thing that a lot of people know about the Mexican Revolution is that the rebels were like considered Mexican bandits and there was wanted signs with their pictures like all over Texas and like, you know, the border cities. So you could see these wanted signs. So the American soldiers were were there trying to capture uh, Pancho Villa. There was a lot of like asking the governor of Parral, Chihuahua to get rid of these American soldiers. Like nobody wanted them there, but nobody could do anything about it. And then like little young Elisa grabbed a Mexican flag from a nearby school and she shouted, and I'll just say the English version of it, but she uh, shouted, I have sought help and they have not supported me. However, someone has to do something. Then she gathered a group of women and children and they, you know, were throwing rocks. They had sticks as weapons to fight the, (laughs) the American troops that were there. And they... They left. The American troops left. <laughs> um, and as the troops fled, everyone was chanting like, Viva Mexico! Viva Villa! <laughs> That's amazing. And it's just yet another example, like every story you've told so far. It's just like the the government or the Americans like did something shitty to people and they're like, okay, well, now I'm going to join the revolution. Like everyone, it's just getting more people to join the shittier they're being yeah no but i love that i love this like children throwing rocks to the point that the army is like okay we'll leave then that's great yeah yeah they fled back to texas but like sadly yeah there's not much else known about them Uh, i mean i think that's all i could find on like the known names of of women who participated during this time there's one more person who's also super cool to talk about that's like very very un like not known Mm -hmm. Not considered a soldadera because he was a trans man. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, his name was Amelio Robles Avila. And yeah, he, he fought the whole time as Amelio. And unlike, you know, other women who joined and then assumed their woman uh, a ro- identity as a woman after the war or during, um, he, yeah, he, he was like, no, I'm Amelio. <laughs> That's who I am. And like, nobody, you know, lived in this manner at this time at all. And like, sure that the term trans like didn't exist at the time, but I mean, that's really, that's what he was. Um, if anyone misgendered him, he like shot them. Like <laughs> he, was a, <laughs> he was intense. Uh, yeah. Another. And he also fought, I think with Zapata is who, who he mainly, whose army he was in, but yeah, like not, not much is known about women, even less about, you know, queer people fighting in, in the revolution, but they were there. Of course they were there. <laughs> Well, I feel like everyone, it seems like everyone who was left was on one side or the other. But also, I think um, just this is the sort of situation and you still see it today. It's like the most marginalized people, like the most like people in poverty who often have like different identities, you know, indigenous and queer and whatever. Like that's who is that's who's going to band together against the elite. And that's kind of always been the way. Yeah. And there's this super i didn't write down the quote but i think it's which one of my books one of them has this super good quote that's basically like if women weren't there no none of these men would have been fighting but it's true 
And I can't remember which one. One of the two that I have. <laughs> well, one of them can, says it. Yeah. No, and let me know the names of all the books so I can put those in the show notes so people who want to read more can read oh, more. I will. I will. And these are like the only two books I could find on Las Soldaderas. And on top of that, one of them, one of them is older. It's called Las Soldaderas. It has like a green or not green, a red cover. That one has the most information, but then whatever other information you find online comes from that book. Yeah, yeah. 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 And and then the other book I bought is the one that I read about Petra Ruiz in, but then that book, it has a lot of the same information from the red book. Like, yeah. they're, they're like the only two books in existence. <laughs> yeah, no, like... I- there's research I've done as well where I'm like, oh, a, a new thing about this person. I'm like, nope, like word for word, that's from this other book. It's like, okay, there is just one book. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's it's like, I don't know, sad and to me and tragic that it took so long for them to even just be recognized that, yeah, there was women there. Um, they were instrumental to the efforts of the war. I mean, it was, I want to say on the 100th anniversary of the revolution that they were even mentioned. It might have been even after that. I think I read that somewhere, though. It's, of course, it's not in my notes, but I want to say, yeah, it was probably definitely over 100 years after the war that yeah. they finally were recognized a little bit. Which is too bad because, like, they're all dead. But yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, after they all had died, it's like, oh, actually, they were great. Like, sorry, they weren't around to, like, get a pension or whatever while they were alive. Right, right. And it's just, yeah, such a common story. So, you know, <laughs> usually I have to explain this, but you know better than anyone else, the scandaliciousness scale. Yes. <laughs> and so I think we're going to score them as a group because they have lots of things in common with each other. And so the first category is scandaliciousness. How scandalous were they? And I'm just going to say at first, like, I feel like at first it's like, oh yeah, Pedro, he's this great soldier. And as soon as it's like, it's a woman, it's like, <gasps> what? <laughs> no, no. So there's Petra. definitely some, there's some <laughs> scandal there for sure. Being a spy is scandalous. I don't know. Where would you rank them? Zero to 10 as a group? I, I would give them 10 out of 10. I think so even- too. Even the woman that you don't know anything about to say, I'm leaving and joining the war, it was the most scandalous thing you could do. Like, what do you mean you're not staying here and being a, serving the house? Like, what do you mean you're leaving? Like, it was a shock to most families, unless they were the ones that were joining together, which was also very rare. But yeah, it was a super scandalous thing to just leave your your home. Like, I'm going to go fight. <laughs> Well, and exactly like the one who's like the 13 year old who's like, oh, I'm just going to like go and be a a war medic now. Like to her wealthy family, they're like, what just happened? Yeah. Like, what do you mean you're going to (laughs) go? And I think it also speaks to how scandalous it was the fact that they were kind of intentionally forgotten about afterwards to be like, let's just pretend like that never happened. We don't want to. It was deliberate. Like, let's not talk about them, actually. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So just to use their labor and then not afterwards. Scheminess. I'm so biased because I, I, I want to say like 10 again. I feel like the same. I feel like the same, like going off to be the bartender spy or even just the scheminess to be like, OK, I'm going to join the army. Women can't do it. I'll just call myself Pedro. Yeah. And like have to hide their identity and then like plan around like, you know what? I'm going to reveal myself now, but I'm also going to quit before I'm fired. Like it's yeah. So that much scheming. Um. <laughs> but also just scheming like the the one who was leading the army like you need to have plans you need to like know how to you need to have schemes to tell your army what to do yeah yeah strategies yeah yeah be a sniper learn about explosives i think 10 is absolutely fair (laughs) for that as well but then we get to significance and this is where it's like to you (laughs) like yeah to to me me. (laughs) they're significant but the way they were so easily forgotten yeah and even like obviously they, the war would not have been won without them, but Fair. then they were left out. So like, yeah, their role was significant, but it was, it was also like hidden. So it's, I don't know, six maybe just. Yeah, I, I was thinking know. like five, six, like if it bounces yeah. out, like they were significant, but it was so like stealth and there's not but like. But no one knew. Yeah. Yeah. No and one there's knew. not statues. There's not like. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like I've heard of, you know, Pancho Villa, like I've heard of some of the men's names but none of these women so like they just it's not their fault that they were forgotten but they were so yeah I, yeah i think a six is fair to sort of balance out like they were significant but <laughs> they were kind of <laughs> forgotten about on purpose yeah yeah and then we get to the sexism bonus how much did sexism hold them back some of them more than others but 
Yeah, I, some of them more than others. So probably, and then I mean, the ones that would have been held back if they hadn't been pretending to be men. <laughs> like, well, that's because it's complicated because it's like, yeah, <laughs> pretending to be a man. So then sexism didn't hold them back. But as soon as they're like, guess what? I'm a woman. Then it suddenly does. It's yeah. I'm like, I maybe seven, uh, five. I don't know because. Yeah, for some of them, even in the camps, they were forced to continue their role as like the traditional role for a woman, cooking, cleaning. But some of them also were not doing that. Some of them were in the front lines, but only because they were pretending to be men, but not all of them, because some of them were fighting as women. So, and the, I know, exactly, <laughs> exactly. It's, so it's like ping ponging back and forth. It's like, so they yeah. were, but then they weren't, but it's like, but they were, but they, like, ultimately, yeah, I think it's another one that sort of balances out Five. in between the two. <laughs> Let's say a six, maybe. Six, okay. Okay, and just a sec. Let me add this up. It's going to be a very good score, which is deserved. And I love to give a good score to like a group of women who are historically not very well known. So ultimately, they get a 32. Anything over a 30, I'm always happy about. Love it. Basically, because <laughs> that's like, that's in the upper echelon. I don't, we don't really have, I haven't done a lot of like women disguised as men. There are some coming up in the new season. But yeah, 32, who's there? Like lots of legends are in this level. Like Nefertiti has 31.5. The Queen of Sheba has 31. La Quintrala, she's at 31. I love her. Oh my God. <laughs> Had you heard that story before? No, I was dying while I was editing that. I was like, oh, this is amazing. <laughs> I was like, I know. I'm just like, oh, Christine's going to like this one. Yeah. No, it was so interesting, that one. But um, yeah, and that's where like, I'm so excited to learn more about yeah, like Latin American history, because there's so many stories like that. And there's often that element where I was like, oh, Christine's going to like this, is because of the like, the way that the stories blend, like that one did with like horror and like ghost stories, but with real people. Yeah, yeah, that was uh, so interesting. So interesting. That stuff, yeah, just like blends together a lot, especially in Latin American history, I find. Very Bloody Mary, like. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, but the Soldaderas, there's not, because the story, like they, this happened, and then it's like, let's forget that ever happened. It's too bad there's not any like famous ghosts, ghost soldaderas. Oh my god, I feel like I forgot someone because there is one soldadera who was so good, people thought she was a witch. Like they thought oh. she had supernatural powers. Um, I must have missed like somewhere in my nose. Where is she? Let me control F supernatural. Oh, there she was. That her name was Maria Quinteras de Mares. Yeah. And um, she was a colonel in Pancho Villa's army. And the only reason she could have a role as a colonel as a woman is because she was married to one of his higher up captains. Um, so it was like one of the exceptions he made to women being in uh, his armies. Was this like a, a favor to his like uh -huh, his colleague. captain. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And their daughter went with them, obviously, wherever they went. But um, she led her uh, troop through many victories and yeah she was so good they thought the opposing forces thought she had supernatural powers <laughs> i thank you yeah when you said supernatural i was like no i forgot someone like i know i did that's what i get for not taking my adhd meds i like pass over things that <laughs> i was like oh i was supposed to read that <laughs> i like that supernatural connection because right away that makes me feel like well there we go like let's make a telenovela let's do something about like a, a witch a witch who is also a soldadera like that's a great story i would love that oh man yeah like just That'd blending the two things together like tv producers out there listening get on someone, it someone do it <laughs> oh, that'd be so good christina tell everybody where they can follow you and remind everybody about all your podcasts too yeah. Um, so at Spooky Tales, we talk about haunted places, myths, legends, people's paranormal experiences, listeners' stories. It's a lot of fun. Sometimes true crime. I co-host it with my twin and my friend. Um, and I mean, like we laugh a little, but it's also scary. So if, if that's not your thing, don't listen. But if it is, you'll love it. And then my other one is Historias Unknown. I co-host that with my twin, Carmen. And yeah, we talk about stories that are like not known um, in Latin American history or Latino, Latina history in the U.S. So like um, these huge protest school walkouts, like, you know, Uvalde, the school in Texas, there was a huge, one of the longest protests for a school, like a school walkout happened in that little elementary school. And like, no one knows because it's been overshadowed by the tragedy that happened at that school. So 
things like that we cover um right now we did like a five episode series on chile like the you know pinochet regime and all that and so yeah and then i actually have a new podcast coming out may 5th it's just like a short daily episodes that are like super short five ten minutes where i just talk about uh like my google searches so like What's the, why are nachos called nachos or what are we really celebrating on Cinco de Mayo? Yeah, things like that. So that one's called A Little Bit de Todo and it's like, it's going to be out then, but not right now. So yeah. When people hear this, it will, no, it will be coming out soon when people hear this. Yes. 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 <laughs> May 5th. <laughs> but yeah. And so, and tell everybody your, your social media and everything so they can follow you too. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, probably, I guess the best one would be just at Spooky Tells everywhere. So TikTok, Instagram. Yeah. I got um, one of your Spooky Tales t-shirts. I just want to mention the like tie-dye one. Oh, that's my favorite one. It's so cute. Yeah, she has really good merch too, just so everybody knows. Thank you. Thank you. I was wearing it to work and someone was like, what's that? I'm like, well, it's this podcast I listen to. <laughs> <laughs> it's eye-catching. <laughs> and Christina, also, thank you so much for being the editor of this show. You um, are an invaluable... Oh my gosh. When I used to edit this, <laughs> like... I'm always, I live my life on the cusp of burnout constantly. But when I was, when I was editing my own podcast, like that's the closest I've ever come to like veering o- over that cusp. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm glad. It's so fun. It's so fun to edit um, the podcast. So good. And you're learning, I feel like against your will, about so many things you might not have uh, not, known about. Not against my will. Okay. Like, even if I wasn't editing, I would be listening for sure. <laughs> okay, good, good, good. Yeah. Because I just feel like I know I have some of my friends who listen to every episode. I know a lot of people pop in and out, but I'm like, you've heard everything. <laughs> you've heard. Yeah, yeah. All but I love it. Stuff. I love yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> good, good. And I'm so and I've wanted to have you on forever. And I'm sure I'll have you on again. So thank you so much for doing this. Yes, thank you. So I do want to let you know that there is a new season of Vulgar History that's going to be kicking off on May 15th. And I can't tell you the theme yet, although some of you have been guessing and some of you have been guessing correctly. I will let you know that because I alluded to it a bit in this episode, which is why I wanted to say there's going to be a lot of revolutions going on. We're looking at stuff that happened in the 1700s, which was an era of, of revolution. In fact... Astrologically speaking, the last time Pluto was in Aquarius was the 18th century. It kicked off. Um, this was when so many things were happening: the American Revolution, the Haitian Revolution, the French Revolution. Like that was that's when all that happened. And in 2024, Pluto is back in Aquarius. And I'm not going to lie that that's not one of the reasons why I am tackling this topic for the upcoming season seven, which is going to start. May 15th, and I will be able to announce the topic for you soon. So stay tuned. I have explained to you, it's going to be a combination of like the Mary Queen of Scots or Lady Jane Grey season mixed with the international season. We're going to be looking at the story of one person, but through the context of what was happening all around the world at the same time. So episodes like this one, although it takes place later, um, the spirit of revolution of the soldaderas, I think it's just such a vibe of a lot of what we'll be talking about in season seven coming soon in your ears on this podcast. And until then, well, I mean, all the time. Anyway, you can keep up with me in this podcast. We are on Instagram at Vulgar History Pod. If you want to get in touch with me, there's a form you can use at vulgarhistory.com or you can also send me a message on Instagram. I do want to say, I read your messages. I'm not able to respond to everybody's messages, but please know I see them and I appreciate them. Um, Sometimes people send me messages asking about like, I want to like people who, and I love this, who want to start a podcast and they want to ask me for advice or information. And I want to say to those people, because I'm not able to respond to everybody. But I mean, honestly, like I just started doing a podcast. I just like got a microphone and then I got a thing that goes over the microphone so your voice sounds better. And I just started doing it. And that's, you know, in the spirit of the soldaderas or any of the tits of people we've ever talked about on this podcast, like just do it, like just start a podcast. And if you start a podcast or if you have started a podcast, let me know. And so I can like let everybody else know about it. Or I think it's just a matter of doing it. Frankly, I, I have, I mean, I think Christina would say the same thing. She's always starting new podcasts actually. So just kind of do it. And then, you know, once you're doing it long enough and you're making friends with other podcasters, including me, then just if your show is good, it'll find an audience is my only advice anyway. But yeah, that's how you can get in touch with me if you're in touch with me. Um, if I get some 
merchandise for this podcast. It's available at vulgarhistory.com slash store. Or if you're outside the US, I recommend using the Redbubble shop, vulgarhistory.redbubble.com. Vulgarhistory.com slash store takes you to our T Public store. And that's great if you're in the US, which a lot of you are, and a lot of you are not. So Redbubble if you're outside the US. Vulgarhistory.com slash store if you're inside the US. I also want to shout out as ever our brand partner, Common Era which is a small business. It's, and when I say small business, I feel like there's two people involved in this business, both of whom are women. Um, and what they do is they make beautiful jewelry inspired by women from, from history and also from mythology. And the pieces, they make gold pieces and they also make gold for May pieces. They're beautiful. I have the Hatshepsut one because I was so inspired by that episode. I had to buy it. They also did Anne Boleyn. And also I have a Medusa one. So, and I don't know, I'm starting my own collection of them basically, but this beautiful, beautiful jewelry, all done like ethically by a small business owned by women. And the people who are on the pieces are all people who you vibe with because there are a lot of people I've talked about on the podcast, like Bodica, Cleopatra, Agrippina, and Anne Boleyn, um, Hatshepsut. And if and when you are shopping there, you can get 15% off whatever you buy by going to commonera.com slash vulgar or using code VULGAR at checkout. Easy to remember for 15% off. They also have, besides the jewelry, other things like hair bows and beautiful stuff. And it's I'm so happy to be in this partnership with them. And you can also support this podcast um, on Patreon at patreon.com slash Writer. So if you pledge at least $1 a month, you get early ad-free access to all episodes as well as ad-free versions of all the past episodes as well. And you can stream those just like you do if you listen on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts or whatever. There's ways that you can just get that feed to be what you listen to. So you can just listen ad-free to the show. And if you pledge $5 or more per month, you get access to also the bonus episodes, which I do things like Vulgar Peace Theater, where I talk about costume dramas with Lana Witt Johnson and Alison Epstein. Most recently, I think when you hear this, you will be able to access our most recent episode, which is about the road to Wellville. A cornflakes based movie um that was a real wild ride to talk about also you can get bonus episodes of we have so this asshole talking about horrible people like captain john smith from the matoka story or thomas jefferson or henry the eighth oh if you're watching mary and george the new tv show on stars i've got james the sixth is on there george villiers if you just want to learn about these trashy men i have those episodes in for people who pay $5 or more on Patreon. And if you also just want to listen to specific episodes of these Patreon ones, you can also just get those. You can just buy an episode. Um, they're available for $5 each without becoming a Patreon member. And also if you want to like game the system, you can become a free Patreon member for a trial. Listen to what you want to listen to and then skip out. And you know what? I respect that as well. So anyway, and also I have a Substack, which is a newsletter which is complementary to this show. It's not like a newsletter version of the same episodes. I'm talking about different people there from what, who I talk about on the podcast. At the moment, I'm just going through women of Tudor history. So I went through the wives of Henry VIII, and now I'm doing the matriarchs of the Tudor dynasty, um, Margaret Beaufort and Elizabeth Woodville. Coming up soon, I'll be talking about people we have talked about on the podcast, like the Grey sisters. Um, speaking of sisters, Henry VIII's is sisters. Anyway, that's just a way that's all free. If you want to like read my words as well as listen to my words. And anyway, next week, I've got a super special episode. I've got an author interview about a new upcoming, actually uh, just come out book about sapphic teen lady pirates. So, you know, you want to listen to that. And until then, everyone, um, keep your pants on and your tits out. Vulgar History is hosted, written, and researched by Anne Foster and edited by Christina Lumagi. Talmor, Sheshin Murahi. Talmor is my home. My family have worked the land for generations. My gran says the island does not belong to us, but we belong to the island. And we must be ready, for a great evil is coming, and death follows with it. 
Listen and subscribe to the latest season of Undertow, The Harrowing, a story glass production presented by Realm, available wherever you get your podcasts. Ah, the web tore. Those that both creators and were created by the threads disentangle from the fringes to feast on the very thing that spawned them. What's that, Jerry? This is how you deal with red! No! <laughs> do not harm my children! Oh, you lost a feather. Can I keep it? No, you can't force me to! Do you know what lies within nothing? Rocket is in trouble, Akasa! Can, can we turn on the windshield remotely? No, she could lose her job as Nakasar. I don't fear Vehar. No, but you fear me. If you intend to trick me, I will not hesitate to sever the oath bond entirely. Why didn't you help me? Coward! I don't have a parachute! I don't like free falling! Counterbalance, a high fantasy audio drama. Season 2, coming 15th of October 2023. Learn more on trilunas.com. I'm Brennan Storr. I'm Paul Bestall. We're the Ghost Story Guys. And every two weeks, we explore first-person stories of encounters with the paranormal from all around the world. Then we have some fun reacting to those stories. We like to say our goal is to scare the hell out of you, then make you laugh. Belief in the paranormal is not required. All you need is a love of great storytelling and curiosity about the world around you. Subscribe to the Ghost Story Guys now on your favorite podcatcher to hear episodes like High Strangeness in Chicago, The Mystery of Missing Time, and The Haunting of Vietnam, along with dozens of others. We've talked about mythical bridges, doppelgangers, haunted seaside towns, and so much more. Remember that story about the guy who was trapped inside a dream and something was hunting him? That was... that was upsetting. Yes. Yes, it was. Want us to help ruin your sleep? Come find the Ghost Story Guys on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and everywhere else fine podcasts live, or at ghoststoryguys.com.